Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, all content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. And welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. This episode will be good for no credits in British Columbia. It'll be good for an ANS credit in Alberta, good for life insurance credits in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario. It'll be good for an IAS credit, uh, FP Canada financial planning credit, IROC professional development credit, and MFDA financial planning process credit. Okay, there's a little backstory to this episode. Um, I had recorded some content uh, similar to this, sort of, with Ray Zadri. Ray, you might recall, was in an earlier episode, uh, just maybe season four, episode 15 or 16, with Mona Zabit, talking about using a digital wealth manager in an insurance environment. Um, and Ray and I had subsequently met and talked about um, him and his experiences with his son. Ray's son is um, fairly far along on the autism spectrum, and that creates a lot of planning challenges. Um, we had a great conversation, um, and then I got a new computer. I moved some stuff over via SharePoint. Uh, something didn't copyright. Could be user error. Never my fault, though. Let's face it. It has to be something else. Um, so anyways, that content is all lost. Uh, Ray has graciously agreed to meet me again to re-record that, but we won't record for quite a while. And we have this space here where I had to fill it with sort of similar content because the way we do the CE credits. And I have this experience as well, although my daughter's experience is quite a bit different from um, Ray with his son. But I have also um, had the uh, joy and challenges of raising a child with a disability. So I'm going to lean on that here a little bit, quite a bit, in fact. We're going to go through that story. And I'm going to use that sort of in the place of what we're going to do here for season four, episode 19. Um, I hope it's helpful. I won't have a guest on for this one. I just couldn't put it together um, in sort of a short enough time span to make this work uh, where I would have a, a guest joining me. So it's going to be just me for one full hour. I hope we're OK with that. Um, can't do anything about it now. We're kind of stuck. But you've been warned. So if you can tolerate it, good. If this is terrible for you, let me know. Um, I have done a couple of just me episodes previously, uh, mostly around the professional responsibility credit back in season three. And I do have to do another one of those before too long here. Okay, the number for today's episode is four. The number for today's episode is four. So I'm going to use a little timeline here. Uh, for those listening, I think I'll be able to make this clear enough. The timeline is a useful um, aid for me to go along with this as well. So here's what happens roughly. I get married in 2003. And there are three children in the mix when I get married. My wife had three kids already, uh, the eldest of whom, um, our daughter, uh, had a disability. So she had, she has epilepsy, although today um, she's been fortunate to not have seizures for quite some time, um, but she does have epilepsy controlled by medication today. Um, and when you have epilepsy as a young baby, which she did, um, then it causes additional complications. So she has um, some other issues, um, learning disabilities, and she's had some um, psychiatric challenges. So all of that sort of combines to give her um, a set of challenges anyways that uh, is not, let's say, typical amongst all kids. And 
we knew this from a young age. So when I got into this relationship, um, we knew that she had uh, challenges. My wife had, you know, um, already dealt with the school system. This is something I'm not going to get into much here because it's before my time. Um, but at that point, uh, my wife had already navigated her way to making sure that our daughter got appropriate care in the school system, um, has uh, things like a, a teaching assistant there for her at appropriate times, um, additional resources like that. And this was um, really good in Alberta. Um, I would say that uh, by the time I was in the picture, uh, we sort of knew the challenges the school system had adjusted and our daughter was able to get the um, support she needed through the school system. At the same time, uh, also the youth health care youth healthcare system, uh, she had really good specialists, um, a neurologist and psychiatrist who were both top notch, specializing in dealing with kids in particular. So lots of supports in place here. Um, not really much in the way of income supports and, and honestly, probably not needed. In more serious cases where there's, let's say, full-time childcare needed or that kind of thing, uh, then you have a different uh, funding model for that. But because uh, her mom was able to provide, my wife was able to provide proper care, um, there wasn't a need for additional income sources. For kids in these cases, though, um, where parents do have unusual childcare needs or that kind of thing, there are funding models available for that. Okay, so some of the things that we dealt with from that point on. Um, first off, like I said, the youth healthcare system was just top notch here. Um, we had great healthcare practitioners. They were interested, they were keen to help out, they uh, communicated with each other. Everything was as good as I think it could have been. The school system, again, was quite good here. Um, then one thing we started doing at that time, um, which is something I talk about in class a little bit, and in fact, those that do CFP exam prep with me know that I have a case study for this, but we were funding an RESP for her. And not everybody would necessarily buy this. We didn't know what it was going to look like for her when she finished school, when she finished post or finished um, high school. Sorry, she was in sort of regular high school classes with other kids, so we knew that there was the prospect of post secondary, and we did fund a registered education savings plan for her. I'm going to talk later on about how that materialized. But this is something that I find sometimes planners are hesitant to do. From my perspective, I think that we should be planning from the perspective of um, sort of hope and optimism. The planner should be thinking about what if things don't work out as planned. But I think where there's a possibility here to make this work, we should be thinking about the RESP. We know that kids are more likely to go to school where there's an R. ESP, I think I just said RDSP, sorry, where there's an RESP in place. And we know that there's some government grants available there, take advantage of that. Uh, we also know that with that uh, RESP in place that there's lots of flexibility later on. And I have a, another friend, this isn't the case with our, our daughter, but I have a, another friend here who um, eventually, his daughter, who has, uh, she's deaf, and because of that, her cost of education was quite a bit higher. I always think about that kind of thing, that you can end up with people who have disabilities, and the cost of education can be substantially higher than for folks without disabilities. Okay. Now, something that we did do at that time, we got the disability tax credit in place. Uh, this was relatively straightforward. Again, because she had two good healthcare professionals who knew her very well and had for a long time, um, even under the sort of clunky old disability tax credit application system that was then in place, it wasn't a big deal to get that done. Um, my wife worked uh, sort of adjacent to the healthcare system, at least adjacent to the provincial healthcare system at the time. So she knew how to talk to physicians. And this was relatively straightforward to get disability tax credit in place. 
And for somebody like our daughter, that's really, as far as uh, the benefit of the tax credit, that's the only time that tax credit is really good. That tax credit can be then transferred to the parents. So in Alberta, it's about today, it's about a $13,000 tax credit at a 25% tax bracket, which is the, the rate at which we're credited here in Alberta. Um, that means $13,000 times 25%, about $3,200 or thereabouts in tax savings resulting from that uh, tax credit. Okay, so everything goes uh, relatively um, smoothly, I would say. Um, and then at age 18, uh, this is where we get a big transition. And the transition here is the move to the adult healthcare system. At this point, uh, our daughter is her own legal person. Uh, she has capacity. Um, she would be able to make her own decisions. There's no requirement for adult guardianship or anything like that. We're gonna hear a different story when we talk to Ray later on about his experiences with his son. But really that transition ends up um, quite challenging because the youth healthcare system basically dumps you at or around age 18. And at that point, you have to go and find new healthcare providers. And Edmonton, for example, uh, we don't have a ton of neurologists here. It can take a very long time to get in with a neurologist. Um, psychiatrists are another matter here. Um, some psychiatrists are really, and I don't want to sound critical of the profession here, some psychiatrists are really um, there to write prescriptions. Some psychiatrists do sort of a counseling job. Uh, you maybe should have a counselor here. Our daughter was very used to a psychiatrist who also filled a sort of counseling role. And that's not necessarily what psychiatrists do. A lot of um, counseling, I think in my opinion anyway, should be delivered by people who are more counselor, social worker, that kind of thing, maybe psychologists or psychotherapists. So you get this maybe fine point about what that healthcare delivery looks like. But regardless of that, you just have these big gaps in the system here. So you have now an adult who has to graduate through the system. Now she lived with us. She stayed living with us for her first few years as a young adult. And so we were able to have some influence here. But in the end, you have somebody who has been sort of kicked out by that youth health youth healthcare system and now has to move into that adult healthcare system. And that's a little bit of a challenge. Not all of her healthcare professionals got replaced right away. It took her a while, for example, to find a psychiatrist that she was happy with. And that that's her prerogative. She should have healthcare workers that she's happy with, um, but it's not like you can uh, pick and choose. It's not like I don't know, picking a restaurant to go eat at. It takes a very long time to get in front of these healthcare professionals. Um, I have a, a cousin who used to work in the addiction system, and she said it's very, very normal here. I don't have any stats around this, but she said it's very normal for uh, kids who are moving from that youth healthcare system to that adult healthcare system to get caught here and end up in addictions or end up homeless. And I can see why it was a tough transition. And it's one that I don't have any uh, great advice around, but I would say that if you're dealing with parents who have kids who have uh, challenges as teenagers, you should prepare them that the transition from teenager from 17, 18 to 18, 19, depending what province you're in, is going to be a difficult one. That whatever they were able to do as kids is not necessarily going to be the same as it is as they graduate into adulthood. So it, it is something I think to prepare your clients for. And it's probably my number one overall takeaway when you're working in scenarios like this. So really from age 18 until our next milestone here, we deal with some issues. Uh, first off, mental health challenges. One of the things that happens here, sort of as a result of the, the difficult transition is our daughter spends 
about five weeks in hospital, consecutive, five consecutive weeks on a psych ward. This is a very challenging thing. Um, my wife at the time had a job that allowed her a ton of flexibility, and she was really able to go to the hospital pretty much every day, all day for that five weeks. Uh, psych ward is not a fun place. I don't uh, recommend spending time on psych wards if you can avoid it. It's, uh, I, I feel for the staff that work there, you're essentially dealing with you know, challenging patients day in and day out, it, lots of uh, potential for violence or just abuse in general. So not a great situation. And that was where we had sort of a fork in the road. And I think if my wife hadn't had such a great ability here, and not just with her work, but her personally, if she hadn't had such a great ability to deal with what was going on with our daughter at that time, I think you could have had a, a really bad outcome where long term, we would have had significant challenges. This is something to think about again, when you're working with parents of children with disabilities, is that you have this more tenuous situation where you can really have unexpectedly somebody with a, a long-term hospital stay, you can end up with some strain on everybody's ability to go to work and generate an income. That I think is something worth planning for. And it might be a case where you need a larger emergency fund. You want to think about how you manage any sort of extended absence from work here. Do you have somebody in the household who has that amount of flexibility? You can't really count on EI here. EI has compassionate care benefits. They're not so easy to access. Um, you generally have to have somebody who has a terminal illness to access those benefits. So not great. Okay. One of the other things we are not sure about at this point, there's almost like three forks in the road as far as capacity with our daughter. So one thing that could have happened here, she could have had a complete lock, uh, lock sorry, lack of capacity. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, then she could have had um, capacity. We, we thought, in fact, with the way some treatments were going, that she might end up not needing any sort of disability supports long-term. And we had to kind of wait to see how that played out. And then we end up with this kind of middle ground where she has, I would suggest, legal capacity. I think that a lawyer would agree with that. Um, she understands the consequences of her actions and so forth. But it's, there is a, a disability at work here and she wasn't able to make the recovery that we were sort of optimistic might happen at that point. As a result, she ends up applying for AISH benefits. AISH is the Assured Income for the Severely Handicapped Program here in Alberta. I'll show in a few minutes, I'll go over the programs in other provinces. Uh, there are a range of programs uh, like this, every province, has some version of this where there's monthly income supports paid and then some supplemental benefits as well. She applies for those benefits and she does qualify. The interesting thing here is that there's no direct relationship between AISH and the disability tax credit. Um, I think some of you have heard me mention this before. You could qualify for AISH and not qualify for disability tax credit or you could qualify for disability tax credit and not qualify for AISH, or you could qualify for both, or you could qualify for neither. Um, so we have this great sort of inconsistency in this country around disability supports. And I'm gonna show a practical effect of that a little bit later on here. Uh, some of you might recall that in December of 2008, we had the introduction of the Registered Disability Savings Plan, the RDSP, we did not immediately um, put our daughter into an RDSP. We weren't sure what was gonna happen at that point. We weren't sure whether there might be a recovery. And because of the generous buyback provisions in the RDSP, it didn't make a lot of sense. So you might recall that with the RDSP, you can get grants or bonds up to 10 years back. So my thought process on this was always that if we sort of waited until 2011, 2012, thereabouts, that we could then fund the RDSP uh, to double the normal level and or thereabouts and catch up on earlier grants and bonds. You can actually catch up faster than that. You can get a maximum of $10,500 of grants in one year and a maximum of $10,000 of bonds in one year, assuming you have that much catch up room 
available. We'll talk more about the RDSP in a little bit here. Okay, I'll take a moment here to talk about AISH, the Assured Income for the Severely Handicapped. These are the figures as of uh, April of 2022. So as of today, uh, $1,685 is the maximum income benefit for a single person. There are some supplemental benefits here. Um, if you have somebody with kids, for example, that adds about $300 a month to it. And there are some situations where you can get more than that. But $1,685 is sort of the safe assumption for a single person to collect age benefits, excuse me, sorry. Uh, that amount is non-taxable. And as of today, it's not indexed. This is something that the current government did in their early days in office, as they said, we're going to freeze the indexation on age benefits. This met with some uproar, um, but it's still true today. The theory here, I guess, being that they're going to lift that indexation when there's a balanced budget, something like that. I, I don't know. I'm not uh, holding my breath for that. Now, what we generally see here, and Aisha is pretty generous in this respect, is that you can earn some amount of what we call non-exempt income with no clawback. So that's generally employment and investment type of income. You can have up to $1,072 of monthly income with no clawback at all. So you could go have a job and make eight or 900 bucks a month and have no clawback. If you start to make more money than that, then you're going to have a clawback, this 50% clawback on income up to $2,009. There are a few sources of exempt income. There are ways you can generate income and still collect AISH. Um, income from a registered disability savings plan would be the sort of best example of that. But there are others. Um, AISH does maintain a policy manual where you can see all of this. I'll include a link to that. I would caution that if you're outside of Alberta, this is vastly different. Okay, so every province is a little bit different here. Um, in Ontario, the clawback starts at a much lower amount of income, uh, $400 a month, if I remember correctly, and is quite a bit stricter after that at 75%. And you're supposed to report gifts from mom and dad and such in this income amount. So if you have support from family, that can influence this. And you'll see this um, in varying degrees across the province. In British Columbia, for example, a caseworker has a fair bit of discretion to decide whether or not a claimant out there can receive adequate support from family that they don't need the program in British Columbia, the PWD program in BC. So you get lots of variability here. Now it's not just an income test, there's also an asset test. So the asset test, is up to $100,000. And in Alberta, anyways, that's $100,000. Again, that amount varies substantially across the country. Um, Ontario, for example, is $40,000. But you can also have $100,000 in an insurance contract in Ontario, which includes a seg fund. So in Ontario, you can kind of go to $140,000. And that excludes, and this is true, I believe, in every jurisdiction, that excludes a house uh, a car in Alberta, two cars, in fact, uh, Henson Trust and an RDSP. A real pension, a defined benefit or defined contribution pension would normally be excluded here as well. And in some provinces, an RESP is also excluded. So the big ones, though, you typically see are House, Henson Trust, and RDSP. And the Henson Trust is basically in most jurisdictions, although it doesn't have to be this in Alberta, but it's basically a discretionary trust, usually settled by mom and dad's estate. So it's usually gonna be a testamentary discretionary trust. Mom and dad die, they leave some amount of principal in trust with a trustee who has absolute discretion. That is, can say, this year, this beneficiary is gonna get $1,000 and next year it'll be $10,000. And the year after that'll be $5,000. That person really has to have absolute discretion in most provinces for that trust to be okay. If they have a fixed entitlement to the property in that trust, then that would normally be considered income or potentially assets against the test for those provincial disability supports. And of course, the RDSP now since 2008, the 
the RDSP allows up to $200,000 of contributions, plus $70,000 of grants, plus $20,000 of bonds, that's potentially $290,000 of money that's gone into the plan. And you are going to see folks, maybe not quite yet, but probably by about 2030 or 2032, maybe thereabouts, you're going to start to see some million dollar RDSPs, RDSPs that, that caught the maximum $200,000 of contributions already, and they keep growing, growing, growing. And that's fine. There's no limit to how much can be in the RDSP. The limit there is only around the grants and bonds and contributions, but the actual account balance, perfectly fine. I'd be interested to hear what people have seen in terms of RDSP balances. I find it's very normal today to see uh, balances in the neighborhood of 100 or maybe $150,000. Okay, so one of the issues with this benefit with AISH, and I think this is true in general for provincial disability supports, is it does kind of encourage a disability mindset. You may have somebody who could go to work and earn a better income, but they know that that's going to disqualify them from this benefit and that requalifying is going to be exceptionally challenging. You really have to jump through a lot of hoops to qualify. Notably, you have to apply for CPP disability benefits. So this is where if you have somebody who's previously worked and has contributed to CPP, they would get CPP disability benefits first, and then their age would be paid or whatever provincial program it is, would be paid on top of that amount. Okay, on to our next then. So the next thing that we see, my next milestone here is going to be, oh, on that note, sorry, we did start funding an RDSP right about this time. I can't remember exactly, but I wanna say late 2011, early 2012. Uh, there weren't a lot of RDSP providers at the time. I went to, um, my financial advisor with whom I have some investments and some insurance. And he set this up with uh, BMO Guardian, uh, which was at the time, I believe McKinsey and BMO Guardian were the only two MFDA platforms where you could have this. So that was the um, yeah, introduction of the RDSP. You could do it through bank channel at the time, but I guess independent MFDA platform, those were really your two choices. Not that there's a ton more today, but there are a few more choices for that. Okay, um, and I'm just gonna comment on this. I, I have addressed this. I'm not airing sort of dirty laundry here. Um, I find the uh, amount of paperwork we get ridiculous for this thing. So we're on a monthly pack for the RDSP and every month um, BMO Guardian sends us um, a statement, an account statement that basically says, here's the amount of grants you got, um, and here's the amount of bonds. It's really just ridiculous, like paper statements, and we can't switch to electronic, we can't do anything else with it. Um, this RDSP, there's actually a little bit of uncertainty around this, and you heard this in the Jonathan Taylor episode in season three, if you listen to that, um, where the ownership of the RDSP is a little bit murky. So the RDSP exists under the Income Tax Act, but ownership of property is a matter of provincial jurisdiction. So with somebody who has capacity, as our daughter does, there's this question of whether or not she owns the plan or whether it can be owned in trust. And you might know that normally registered assets can't be held in trust. But right now we are working under a sort of temporary measure, which is supposed to sunset in 2027, that says that I can actually own that account. I can be the trustee on that account with her as the beneficiary. So it gets a little bit sticky around this. Um, one day, I think it's likely that I'm gonna be removed as the trustee of that account and that she's going to be the one to have full control. We'll still be able to contribute to it, but she's gonna be the one that's gonna have full control over it. I don't think that's gonna be a concern here. But I do have concerns around this in some cases. If you have somebody who has enough capacity to have that control, but maybe doesn't have enough capacity to be, be a great decision maker, they could end up cleaning out their RDSP prematurely. The big challenge with that being that when you take funds out of the RDSP, 
that triggers under normal circumstances, that triggers the assistance holdback amount, which is essentially, although it's a more complicated formula than this, essentially a repayment of grants and bonds received in the prior 10 years. So we do start to fund that RDSP right about 2011, 2012, when we have a little bit more certainty around her um, situation. Now, funding that RDSP also means investment choices here, and you're sort of left with this tough spot. I, this, to me, is always a big dilemma. We know that it's long term. She really won't touch the money for decades and decades. And it's the situation where if you had good investment knowledge and good investment experience, uh, you would go with the all equity or almost all equity investment. Um, but it's money that's invested in trust. So you kind of have to give up some returns here. It's a little bit of a source of frustration for me um, because I know what the right thing to do is as far as investing this, but the investments here are really pretty boring and have to be pretty boring. Not that I would be putting it in Bitcoin or anything like that. Um, I wouldn't be doubling down on Zoom today or what have you, um, but I would like to see a little bit more equity uh, concentration there. Okay, now I want to pick on something that happened here, and this ties into this idea of having a good, um, let's say, capacity, but maybe not being all the way there. So right about this point, right about age 22, I want to say, um, when she applied for age benefits, because the application process is so long, she got a year of back payment. She was not earning any real income at this point. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to $15,000 a year, not enough to be a taxpayer. She went to a financial institution. She was using a, just a bank branch bank at the time. And she sat with an advisor about that $10,000. Good for her for doing that. And the advisor had her contribute, uh, and this always drives me nuts, had her contribute $10,000 to an RRSP, okay? Not making any money uh, on AISH. The RSP is not an exempt asset. The RSP counts against your AISH test. It just, it struck me as grossly irresponsible, really ill-advised planning. Uh, I'm sure that that advisor you know, put a tick in the box for setting up an RRSP account. Um, even a TFSA would have been better here. And we did have TFSA in place at the time. Um, TFSA still wouldn't have been great. It's still not exempt against the $100,000. Um, I know at the time that financial institution did not have an RDSP on its shelf. I'm not sure if they ever talked about the fact that she had a disability. And it's not immediately obvious. You could have a, a lengthy conversation with her and have no uh, awareness at all that she has a disability. Okay, now at that stage, roughly about that age, 21, 22, um, this is where um, she says, look, I'm a young lady. I would like to live the sort of life of a young lady. She had been working at the time um, and she moves out on her own, which is great. We were very happy when that happened. We knew there was going to be some challenge with it, but we were very happy. It's, you know, that's an important thing for a young adult. And we really were very optimistic about this. At the same time, um, we were, I think, duly cautious. And what we see here over the next few years is a fair bit of instability. Okay? And this is really, um, I think, something, again, for parents of children with disabilities to be prepared for. Um, probably about once every 10 months or so, she would switch residences. In fact, um, one of her roommates uh, during one of those stints is probably listening to this podcast. Um, she works in the business and would be, um, I think, interested to hear this. It's uh, you know funny how you, all these things go full circle. So the um, just this amount of instability and that put some strain on us, we often end up helping her move and not a big deal, we're there for her. Uh, but you know, we have three kids and you have to kind of balance that out a little bit, brother and sister, or sorry, the other, the brothers would often come and help with the moves. And that's all, um, you know, that can be a little bit frustrating after a while. So um, lots of relocation here and lots of transition. Um, 
she worked a lot of retail type jobs, could never really find something satisfactory, occasionally ended up in management roles or that kind of thing. Um, and that was, I think, frustrating for her, uh, challenging to deal with. So that degree of uh, sort of transition and instability makes it hard for her to plan, hard for her to set good roots, and just creates a lot of strain, I would suggest, on her and on everybody around her. Now, an interesting thing that happens at this time, um, at least now it's interesting, at the time it was exceedingly painful, um, the disability tax credit, uh, under normal circumstances, the disability tax credit has to be renewed every three to five years. In cases where the disability is uh, never going to go away, where the case is very obvious, so somebody with a terminal condition, uh, maybe something like Parkinson's, you're never going to have to reapply for your disability tax credit. But in cases like hers, you have to reapply usually every three to five years. And we had a reapplication here right around 2016. And we had taken it to her at the time, her, actually still her psychiatrist. Uh, that person filled it out. I felt like they did a good job filling it out. It wasn't anything I anticipated any kind of problem with. We send in that um, DTC application, the form uh, T2201. Uh, and uh, CRA rejected it. CRA, actually, what the first thing that happens here is they ask for more evidence. So they come back. They didn't reject it outright. They sent a form back to the physician asking for more evidence. Okay, so the physician fills it out, gives more evidence, and so forth. And that form was rejected. Then CRA came back to that and said, no, we are not accepting this. And there was just a massive amount of bad communication here. This was really poorly handled. Um, what happened was our daughter had named me as her authorized representative, um, doing you know the, through the proper. I think it's a T. I can't remember the form T ten thirteen if I remember right. Anyways, I was properly named as authorized representative, so I was communicating back and forth with CRA. Um, they would occasionally hide behind a privacy wall where they would say, well, we can't share that with you. I'd say, why do we have authorized representative then? They lost at least two faxes that I sent. This was a real headache. Um, and we were dealing with the, not to pin blame on them, I just would point out that there are different offices that handle different activities. This was done through the Surrey Tax Services Office. And they... Um, lost some communication. There's supposed to be a 90-day period in which you can file an objection when the disability tax credit gets rejected, um, but they didn't send any correspondence to the authorized representative, to me. Uh, they mailed it to her only. She has a disability. Um, I did end up getting around that. We ended up um, able to, to get an objection in. Um, took about a year for CRA to process, process the objection. Um, I put a lot of evidence in the objection. I relied on some court cases where people had made successful arguments in cases similar to hers about access to disability tax credit. I relied on the language in the Income Tax Act. I wrote a pretty robust um, objection back here. And I would suggest this is kind of unfair. Um, it's the kind of thing, not that I would have done this to a level a tax lawyer would have. I probably care more, but no less than a tax lawyer would have. And I wasn't shy about putting in some hours. I think this is the kind of thing where if you'd gone to a tax lawyer or maybe even an accountant to get this work done, you would have had a lot of billings on it. And I always wonder about this, about people where their DTCs get rejected. A lot do. About 12% of disability tax credit applications or reapplications get rejected in any given year. And I always think about the sort of inequity around that. So the... Uh, disability tax credit, what ends up happening here is we get to the year and sort of just before, maybe two or three days before CRA's one-year deadline to deal with the objection, I got a phone call, an actual phone call. It was pretty surprising um, from that tax services office. And the lady warned me. She said, we are going to reject your um, objection here. I said, okay, I will see you in tax court then. And I started writing up my, um, I looked at the, the docket for the tax court in Edmonton. I knew that we were going to be uh, going to court in about November of 2019. 
Um, and I expressed that on the phone to this lady. I said, okay, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to go to tax court over this. And I believe we would have won in tax court. Now, what ended up happening about two weeks later, I got written communication from CRA saying, yeah, you're right. Uh, the objection is yours. You, she should qualify for disability tax credit. I thought, well, that's a huge waste of taxpayer resources to have fought that battle um, over really something. I, the disability tax credit didn't even matter for her. That was not the point. She can't really use it. She doesn't earn enough income. That was my comment earlier that that disability tax credit is great for you know, a, a household. You've got mom and dad able to use it when the child is a minor child. But once they're an adult, unless they're earning really good income, then you can't really uh, get any benefit out of disability tax credit. So that, that's sort of a tough one. Um, but it was about the RDSP because the RDSP properly at that time, the rules were, if you lose access to disability tax credit, the RDSP is supposed to be shut down. Now, what I did in response to that was we actually stopped funding the RDSP. When I got that word from CRA, I said, okay, there's a good chance our RDSP is gonna get wound up here. We're gonna to have to repay grants and bonds. We get our principal back, but, uh, and the investment gains would have been taxable in our daughter's hands. And she would have actually gotten the principal. So we would have to negotiate that. There's no, it's not like an RESP where the principal is returned to the plan subscriber. There is no plan subscriber in an RDSP. There is only a plan beneficiary. So we would have had to collapse the plan. And I think technically if we had, and it's not, our business sort of CRA never talked to the financial institution to be more guardian about this at all. Uh, but I think technically the plan should have been wound up there. Uh, we were more than a year where the RDSP, or sorry, where there was no disability tax credit. Now it ended up retroactively applying, but that is the trigger in the Income Tax Act that more than one year with no, or that was the trigger, sorry, um, in the Income Tax Act that more than one year with no access to the disability tax credit should cause a wind up, should have caused a wind up. That rule changed in 2019. And today, if you lose access to disability tax credit, basically no more contributions into the plan. And then starting at age 60, you'll take income out of the plan, but it'll continue to grow tax deferred. Now, the other interesting thing that happens right about that time is she calls us up and she says, hey, I wanna go to school. Um, and she initially goes to one of the local post-secondaries here, tries that out. That doesn't really turn out to be her speed, but we were so happy that she did it. And we did use the RESP at that point. So dipped into the RESP to help pay for that. And then she ended up going to a sort of career college where she took a, a six month certificate program in medical office administration. Great, we were very happy for her. Um, she did parlay that into a, a couple of jobs afterwards. This instability in the job market still continues for her. Um, she doesn't, uh, and good for her, she doesn't deal very well with not being treated well at work. So when she's not treated well at work, she tends to um, pull pin. I would suggest she has a lot less tolerance for that than a lot of other people do. Um, I, now, part of that is she has that insulation available from AISH. So she's, I think, able to afford to have less tolerance than other people maybe do for being treated badly at work. Um, but she does end up using her RESP. So that's great. And that goes back to my comment earlier, don't sell the RESP short just because you're working with parents of a child, sorry, parents where there's a child with a disability in the mix. Okay. All right, the next step we see here is right about the start of COVID actually, sort of curiously, right around the start of COVID, um, we see all this instability in housing and really the extent to which it causes her both financial and emotional strain is too much and some strain on us too, honestly. This is maybe a little bit of a selfish decision as well. And so what we do here, I started looking at condos at the time. The Edmonton condo market, um, still is quite depressed and at the time was really just terrible. 
And I looked at this, I thought, you know, I've never been a big fan of owning a condo. I know you have to have a larger emergency fund. You have to set up for a special assessment one day. You're sort of at the whims of the condo board. But, you know, she was spending um, a fair bit of her ACE money and really had to rely on roommates and that kind of thing just on rent. So she could have gone and she had actually had um, one experiment with subsidized housing. That was not great. That was a pretty... Um, rundown building in a rundown part of town. Uh, we didn't feel great about having her there. So we looked at this and said, all right, look, there's condos on the market now for you know roughly a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars in decent neighborhoods, buildings that are you know reliable enough that, that we felt comfortable with them. Um, and we looked at that and said, why don't we give her a hand here uh, with home buying? And we haven't done this with any of our other kids, which I am a little bit concerned about. Um, you know, as of today, this is something the other kids actually don't know about. Um, but we, although we've given financial support to all the kids, um, this is the most um, most money at one time for any one of the kids. And we ended up um, financing or sorry, funding the down payment here. Now I love what we did here. I'm super proud of this and maybe ridiculously so. This is the financial nerd in me coming out. Um, a lot of people don't know this and I had to fight with the financial institution where we have my wife's R, um, R, RSP about this. A lot of people don't know this though, but you can use the home buyer's plan to purchase a house for a child with a disability. So we own a home, my wife and I own a home. Um, Normally, when you own a home, you can't use any home buyer's plan. But we're buying a house for a person with a disability. She had not owned a home in that time. That's an eligible use of home buyer's plan. So we both we knew we were going to make the down payment. We both put the amount towards the down payment into the home buyer's plan uh, or into the RSP. Sorry, let it sit there for 90 days, which is the requirement, and then pull it out to make a down payment on. A condo. So we, we had planned this out over quite a while. Um, our daughter picked out the place. We put her in touch with a real estate agent that, uh, that I trust. And she found a, you know, a decent condo um, at a very affordable price. She was very financially responsible with our money here. Um, we made enough of a down payment that now her monthly mortgage, she pays the mortgage out of her age benefits and she pays the condo fees and it really is a net increase to her income. She's far better off financially than she was when she had to pay rent out of her age benefits. And I'm under no illusions about building equity here. Um, it's a, we're on a 30 year mortgage, uh, fairly low rate, but there's, I'm under no illusions that one day she's gonna uh, sell this condo and realize some big capital gains. I fully expect that she lives there until the condo complex is no longer inhabitable and maybe end up with something around land around that or maybe end up with a monster special assessment. I don't really know, um, but this is not a case of building equity through home ownership. Um, although again, there's, I guess, some nominal value to the land there, but it really was about creating stability. And because it's a house, it's not, uh, applicable against the H asset test. So perfectly fine for her to own a house. So the way we have this is um, she's on title, we're on title. We all had to go on title together to get a mortgage, uh, but she is the beneficial owner of that property. So we have a trust deed that says, you know, as much as we made the down payment, it, the intention is that she is the sole beneficiary of any capital gains on that property. That would allow her to use her principal residence exemption if she ever does sell it. It means that we don't have any concerns about it interfering with our principal residence exemption, nothing like that. It's just her as the owner of that property. So that to me was pretty efficient. Again, that's the kind of thing, I know we just have this uh, new tax-free first-time home buyers account. I'm not sure that it's gonna have any sort of equivalent opportunity with it. This is a, to me, a use case that still exists for the, the home buyers plan that big lump sum contribution, knowing that's going to be your down payment, get the big tax deduction on that, and then you pull that out and then repay it over the subsequent 18 years. You get a couple of years of grace and then 15 years plus 
the uh, 60 days into the last year to make all your repayments. So really you get 18 years to repay your home buyer's plan amounts. Um, I do have concerns about owning a condo um, and ultimately I end up being the one to do the work on this thing. Um, so when she's got a plumbing problem or an electrical problem or whatever it happens to be, I'll be the first one to go over and have a look at it. Um, we've had the only trades we've had go in so far was somebody to install a new washer and dryer. Um, I guess technically not trades, but get the idea. Um, so it's, you know, now I'm sort of maintaining two properties. Thankfully, the second one is smaller, but it does mean from time to time I haul my tools over there and have to do some work. Um, I'm prepared for that special assessment to show up one day. Won't surprise me at all when we get some whatever twenty or thirty thousand dollars special assessment, and I think it's something we have to be prepared for. And condo owners in general should be ready for this. Now, the RDSP. So where is she at with her RDSP? This is an area that I find again pretty interesting, uh, closing in on a hundred thousand dollars of account value in that plan. And I'm putting in, I think I'm at 200 bucks a month right now in my pack. I'm doing a little bit of catch up for prior years. You might know that uh, at she's a, she earns income well below the threshold for this. So we get 300% on the first $500 and 200% on the next thousand. So really I'd have to put um, 1500 bucks a year into the plan, but I'm getting some catch up from earlier years. And we get a letter every, right about now, actually every April from CRA, that shows here's how much you could put into the plan to maximize grants. And we're just sort of doing that until we're caught up and then I'll pare back those contributions a little bit, but really, really close to that $100,000 mark. Although I, I don't know what it is. Uh, we had a little bit of market correction the last couple of days here, all well and good. Um, what I know out of this is that assuming nothing drastic happens, that when she gets to age 65, where her age benefits end, she won't have much in the way of Canada pension plan, maybe a tiny little bit. She'll have old age security. Um, she won't have to rely on guaranteed income supplements. She'll be able to use the RDSP and really probably have the best financial life she's had. Keep in mind there that she may end up paying rent at that point. We'll see what's happened with the condo by then. So this is going to give her um, good financial freedom right about the time that mom and dad won't be around for her any longer. Um, I don't expect that uh, you know we'll be um, able to financially support her that much. We'll be uh, maybe dead by then, um, or at the very least worried about our own uh, financial independence. So I hope that's good. I, I think it's a fairly detailed case study um, from both the financial, a little bit from the healthcare perspective on raising a child with a disability. Um, I do think my firsthand experience with this um, equips me well to talk about our DSP, you know, a little twist with the home buyer's plan, uh, concerns about capacity. We don't get into any hence in trust. Uh, we, I did mention it briefly. Um, my will, our wills do have the ability to sponsor a hence in trust here. I don't know if it'll be necessary. Um, it's that question of what's going to, what age do we die at? What's gonna be left behind for her? What does an inheritance look like? So that may or may not happen. Um, I won't be around to find out. All right, thanks for joining me for that case study. And I have a few more comments here beyond that around uh, folks with disabilities. Hi, and welcome back. So this uh, recording has turned into quite the saga. Um, my wife, um, I read almost everything I recorded. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're up against a deadline because I lost um, the uh, raw recording. So uh, my wife ended up in hospital tonight. Uh, she's dealing with some neurological activity. Um, so I am COVID right now. So I am not in the hospital with her yet. There's all the standard protocols. Uh, so I'm sitting on a park bench um, about a block from the Green Nuns Hospital in Edmonton waiting to get in and I'm going to take this opportunity to record the last few minutes. So the sound and audio quality, uh, sound and video quality will not be great and I apologize for that, but it'll only be for a few minutes here. Um, so first off, before I get to what you see on the screen here, I just want to comment on joint ownership. Um, I talked about my wife and I uh, 
being on the mortgage. So we've co-signed and we jointly own this house with our daughter. Um, and I normally am not a fan of joint ownership. I specifically have an episode called um, Why Jason Hates Joint Ownership that uh, Christian and I recorded earlier this season. Um, and I still am not a fan of joint ownership in most cases. Um, in this instance, it was required. It was really the only way that my daughter would qualify for a mortgage. I was not prepared to gift her the amount of money to buy a house outright. Um, and I don't think we're at that much risk here. It's a secure debt. There's still a, a house behind it. So she can't incur really any more debt than the value of the condo. And fortunately, the value of the condo is already fairly depressed. So I'm not that concerned here about joint ownership going um, awry for us. And like I said, we have emergency funds in place and uh, so forth. And then we co-signed a debt, which again, I'm not normally a big fan of. Um, in this instance, um, I do have a fair bit of control over the circumstances. The geese flying overhead here. And um, and we, we do have, again, it's a a mortgage debt. So there's a secure debt behind it. I'm not as concerned as I would be um, where, and I don't know, I'd be curious to hear why I'm wrong here. I'd love to hear people fire back and say, Jason, you made a terrible mistake. Um, and maybe one day I'll find out that I have. But um, in a case like this, I, I couldn't see a better way to do it. And like I said, I think the reward here, and we've seen this now, she's been in the place for two years. It really has introduced an awful lot of um, stability into her life. Um, she still has employment instability, uh, but her residence has been steady that whole time. It really lets her build some community. She's She knows her neighbors. She's friends with her neighbors, that kind of thing. Her friends, her social circle um, knows where she is. Like it's, I do like this. I think that it's a, a reward in that sense. So I'm happy with where we're at two years after the decision. Um, maybe 10 years later, I'll have a different uh, different bit of advice about this. Um, but it just goes to show that there's no solution that's not, um, that's never a good solution. So, you know, joint ownership might work out. Co-signing for a debt might work out. Um, I guess uh, we'll find out. All right. Uh, the screen here, what you'll see on the screen is um, programs by province. So um, I, I don't think I've ever seen a list like this. I'd love to see it. And I know that the government of Canada maintains some websites where you can do benefit searches. Um, they tend to be fairly, um, I don't know what the right word is. You, you can search for disability supports, but you can't necessarily search for the income disability support for that province. So this is a listing of all of the provincial income disability support programs. Um, it's curious here, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia both call their program uh, DSP. Actually, uh, curiously, New Brunswick calls it Disability Support Program and doesn't abbreviate it. Uh, Nova Scotia calls it DSP and does abbreviate it. Uh, PEI used to call theirs the same thing, but it's now Access Ability Supports. Um, and Newfoundland is a little bit of an anomaly here. Um, Newfoundland does have a bunch, Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador, sorry, Newfoundland and Labrador. There are a bunch of supports here but it's not like in other provinces where there's kind of one income support program. It's sort of a, a mishmash of uh, different programs. So you can uh, Google all of these or whatever you need to do for the province you're in. Um, they all have their uh, specific set of rules around how they test income and assets, and they all have it. They all have income or asset tests. Okay. The object for today's episode, and sorry, I did the number and object that a sequence that's on me, but I happen to have the object with me that I was planning to use anyways. Um, it's my nice little COS wire. Sorry, I guess they're wireless as far as um, the computer is concerned. They still have a little wire that connects them to each other. They're not quite as fancy as AirBuds, but they're also not as expensive as AirBuds. Um, I've been too cheap to buy AirBuds because I'm terrified to lose them. Um, but uh, yeah, this nice little, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 bucks for this little COS um, headset. It sort of goes around the back of your neck and then has the kind of clamps over the ears. So I like it for doing physical activity while I'm listening to podcasts and so forth. I find myself uh, every morning doing that while I'm uh, doing my morning chores. And then sometimes while I'm out and about um, on foot, I'll listen to episodes as well. 
So I hope that's good. I hope the case study was helpful. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. Join us again in uh, two weeks when I'll be chatting with Kent and he'll actually be chatting with me. We'll sort of flip the tables here. Uh, we're going to talk about building a financial advisory practice on YouTube. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, the pro bono financial planning work that I've been doing now for about five years or maybe six years now. And I quite enjoyed this. Um, Kent is a, a favorite former student of mine, as you'll see in the interview. Uh, he gives me the gears a little bit here, which I like. And uh, enjoy your continued studies. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits, and you'll have access to our full library of content.